Welcome, welcome. It's so exciting uh, to see you all here. It's really just wonderful. So I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everybody, um, our speakers of today, the last year's Planet Prize winners. They spoke so passionately and inspiringly uh, about how they leveraged their Planet Prize in just the last um, year. Welcome, of course, to the Planet Prize jury members, headed by uh, Professor Johann Rockström. You've done a fantastic job in selecting this year's national champions, and this day is really yours. We're here to celebrate all of you. So, thank you as well to the Villas Institute for hosting us here today. So, many of us actually meet for the very first time, and um, I thought to spend a couple of minutes to just introduce ourselves, who we are, and um, yeah, this is us uh, 17 years younger. Uh, <laughs> not quite in the same shape, but almost. <clears throat> um, so, who are we? Why did we start Frontiers? And why did we start the Frontiers Planet Prize? So, this is Henry and myself, 17 years ago, when we launched Frontiers in Neuroscience at the Society for Neuroscience meeting. And when we did that, we did it, uh, we did it with a group of very close neuroscience colleagues, people we were building a career with. Um, over there, you see Idan Segev. He's as well with us in the audience, so please uh, make sure to say hello uh, to him. He was uh, the first uh, chief editor of uh, Frontiers in Neuroscience. Yes. Good. That's for you, Idan. And when we started Frontiers, it was really um, uh, out of a shared common frustration, frustration that our science was locked away behind uh, prohibitive paywalls where it was not easily accessible to other scientists or yet alone the public. So um, this, as you already gathered, um, uh, we're neuroscientists. This is Henry. Um, he's actually a biophysicist by training. So he spent most of his career recording from brain cells, trying to understand how they communicate, how they talk to each other. And then it became his life's mission to put it all together, the entire brain architecture, every single neuron and all the different brain cells into one big brain simulation to understand how the brain actually works and creates the world that we feel and see around us. I, on the other hand, am a biopsychologist, so slightly different. Uh, I'm trying to understand um, how memories and emotions are formed in the brain, and I um, also was interested in autism research, and this was inspired by our stepson Kai, who you can see here holding that little rat. So we were building rat models to understand or try to understand autistic brains. So when I published my very first paper at the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, just down the mountain here, um, I wanted to, of course, share it with colleagues and with friends, and I was quite surprised, shocked indeed, uh, to find out that I couldn't download this paper because our university did not have the subscription to this uh, life science journal. We were a tech university. And um, I realized that if I myself cannot download my own research at one of the richest universities in the world, how would then other researchers and maybe uh, less wealthy universities be able to download it? Or parents of autistic children, how would they access the latest autism science? And indeed, they cannot, because not even the richest universities in the world have access to all of the scholarly science journals out there. Not Harvard, not my university, not Oxford, not Cambridge, not a single one has access to all of the science. Doctors who are treating you today cannot afford uh, the subscription to all of the top journals even. Uh, companies, startups uh, can't uh, easily access the science and we live in a knowledge economy. Everything is fueled by science. And indeed, if somebody in your family has autism or falls sick with cancer or Alzheimer's, you cannot access the science on the latest treatments in order to help them. So we really decided to do uh, something about this, because we can and we should do something about it. So we op launched an open science uh, platform and we are really on a mission to make all of science open so that scientists can work better together and deliver solutions on a faster pace to enable these healthy lives on a healthy planet. 
And we started off obviously in the neuroscience community, but today there's well over 200 uh, open access peer-reviewed journals spanning nearly 2,000 specialized academic uh, communities. And all of these journals are open access, and we are also started aligning them very closely in the last couple of years with the sustainable uh, development goals, because we want to speed up particularly those solutions that enable these healthy lives on a healthy planet. The journals are rigorously peer-reviewed by active researchers, nearly 300,000, who we very carefully select to our editorial boards from all the top universities. So there, there on the top you have the University of California system, Chinese Academy of Sciences, Harvard, Swiss Federal Institutes, they're all represented on our editorial boards. And of course, when uh, in the last uh, 17 uh, years, we have actually grown quite a lot. We became one of the largest, top 10 largest, but as well, one of the most cited publishers in the world. And that in itself is quite an accomplishment because many of the publishers that you do see on this leaderboard, they had a lifetime, if not over 100 years, to build their reputation, to build their brands, and to build their citation impacts. So it's something that we are really proud of. And when we grow, we grow always with the highest quality in mind, because everything is out in the open and it's transparent for everybody to see. So we're quite obsessed in, in, in determining the quality and we survey thousands of people every single month, every year. And when we ask them about the quality, they rate the quality of Frontier's articles, the peer review and the editorial boards as either good or excellent. We also survey them about how trustworthy they find uh, publishers. So we ask researchers, how trustworthy do you find these publishers? And uh, Frontier's trans trustworthiness last year was just at the same level as some of the oldest brands in publishing. Wiley and just a few percentage uh, points uh, short of Springer Nature and Elsevier. Again, brands that have been around for over 100 years. But this is probably the most beautiful data representation, at least I find so, that we have in Frontiers. We published well over half a million research articles, um, and they've been viewed nearly three billion times uh, from all over the world. Every dot here represents a researcher, an innovator, somebody that is hungry uh, and, and eager to read science. And these are the people that really need to be accelerated with the power of open science. And I want to spend now a few minutes on why it is actually so incredibly important to make all of science openly accessible to anybody. And nothing demonstrates this accelerator, uh, accelerator effect of si open science better than the recent COVID pandemic. So I'm going to take you down onto memory lane. So it's January 2020, four years ago. And we were still not quite aware that the pandemic was looming, but Chinese scientists had already sequenced the genetic code of the coronavirus and deposited it uh, openly accessible into an open data bank. And that immediately triggered the race for a vaccine at a global level. This is the example of the BioNTech co-founders within the course of just one weekend. They had read the paper, they accessed the genetic code, they developed immediately eight different vaccine candidates, and they prepared their teams for production. Now, of course, these are exceptional people, but I can assure you what happened at BioNTech also happened at the very same time at Moderna, at AstraZeneca, at Pfizer, and at countless research labs across the globe. The moment the code was out, people were racing for the vaccine. We fast forward two months into March, we are all in lockdown and everybody is desperately looking for solutions uh, to get us um, out of lockdown, save lives, save the economy. And of course, everybody is looking to scientists because only they can deliver vaccines and treatments. And it became blatantly clear at that time that if we want uh, them to deliver these solutions fast, the science needs to be made open. And that is exactly what happened. In March, the White House and a group of others created a data bank where they deposited all the coronavirus-related research articles and mandated that they need to be openly accessible to everybody. 
At that time, it was about 30,000 of these articles. By the end of the pandemic, we had well over half a million research articles in this data bank, open to people, open to machines. And this is really what accelerated everything, enabled the collaboration and delivered vaccines and treatments at a speed never, ever seen before in human history. It was by far the fastest. But what has been achieved for COVID, at least for, for a while, because now it's been closed down again, I mean, the irony of it, it has not been achieved for other respiratory diseases. They still kill 7 million people a year. And it has not been achieved for the biggest killers, uh, cancer and cardiovascular diseases. Just a fraction of the science is made openly accessible. Why is that so? Do we not want to accelerate solutions to save these lives as well? And then, of course, the biggest challenge that all of us are facing, why we're here in this room today, climate change and keeping the nine life support systems of our planet within a safe operating zone. A lot of the science is already made openly accessible, but more than half of it is still behind paywalls. But we are on a ticking deadline here. We have to accelerate all of the different solutions. And how are we supposed to do that if all of us don't have access to all of the science? Even some of your papers, the national champions, many of them were open access, but some of them were not open access. And that is something we need to change. Because our planet does have boundaries, as you all well know, and if these boundaries are transgressed, our safety and our prosperity, maybe even some of our survival, is actually a danger. The planetary boundary concept was first introduced now 17, 16 years ago in this revolutionary paper by Johann Rockström and a college of some of the most renowned uh, climate and earth scientists on the planet, some of you sitting here in the room. And they identified nine life support systems. And for each one of these life support systems, they defined very concrete measures that tell you whether we are in a safe operating space, or as Johan once put it, and I won't forget it because it was beautiful, it's like a garden that is fenced, and within this fenced garden, we as humanity can thrive and prosper. But if we run over this fence, go over this one boundary, we move into an unsafe zone until we reach tipping points where the life support system comes crumbling down and maybe even create a chain reaction and affecting the other life support systems. Six of these nine boundaries have already been transgressed, as you well know. We're destabilizing our climate, destroying biodiversity, overusing fertilizers, cutting down too many forests and so on. We, as humanity, as scientists sitting here today, we have an obligation to reverse these planetary trends. We all have families, and there is nothing that I wish more for your children and my girls as well than to live a healthy life, to live a prosperous life, and to live a safe life within the boundaries of a healthy and a safe planet. And that's why we're here today, to ensure that. And time is ticking. Six years where we have to half carbon dioxide emissions, less than 30 years to get to a green economy, a completely different economy for all of us. So many things have to fall in place, from politics to business and so forth. But without science, this is absolutely not achievable. And without making all of our science openly accessible, we just won't get there on time. So let's open it all up. Now, our personal tipping point, and this is why we created the Planet Prize, really came when we read this book um, three years ago, I think it was. It was on a Christmas break. We got it as a Christmas present. Um, it was in the mountains. And the book not only described the looming environmental catastrophe, as so many others do, and as we see all the time on the news, but it had really this very concrete measurement framework telling us this is how far we can go, this is how we can as well revert and come back into the safe operating space. So for us, it was almost a no-brainer, and uh, we came back from the mountains, and the very same day, Henry contacted Johan, 
Uh, they didn't know each other at uh, that time. But Johan took the call, and within just a couple of days, they had actually worked out the concept of the Frontiers uh, Planet Prize. And the goal, really, uh, of the Planet Prize is to recognize scientists who work on the planetary boundaries, understanding the planetary boundaries, but as well work to revert the planetary trends and keep us into this safe operating space. You, who sit here today. But at the same time, we also wanted to ignite this Olympic-style spirit. We are celebrating our footballers, we are ce celebrating our sports people. We've got to be creating this type of competition amongst universities and countries as well to bring forward their very best researchers and their very best science in order to create solutions for planetary health. Let's do this. That was the idea, we didn't overthink it, we just did it. And within just 15 months, the concept was born. A small team was assembled under Jean-Claude, whom you just uh, well met throughout the whole uh, two days already. Um, we activated our networks, the first universities were contacted, they started um, bringing forward their scientists. Uh, national academies were selecting amongst these uh, scientists the national nominees, and then under Johann's leadership, the jury of 100 was created, and many of you sit here, or some of you sit here today as well. And there, there are some of the world's most recognized uh, planetary uh, earth scientists, climate scientists, and their job was really to select amongst these national nominees the one national champion, and amongst the national champions, the three international winners, who would then take home each a million francs to support their research. So here we are today, at the second edition of the Planet Prize. This is our 23 national champions. We're here to celebrate you, really. And I really like to think of you as our scientific heroes. Because you are the ones who are working very hard to keep us within the safe operating space. But you're as well the ones who send a message of hope that we can and that we will keep our planet safe and keep our planet healthy. So with this, let's really celebrate our national champions. This is really your day. So congratulations once again. <laughs>